All right. Good morning, everybody. Hey, come on in if you're out in the foyer and come join us. I know that we have uh, parents that are checking kids in today with the kids ministry. And I know, yeah, woo -hoo, amen. Lots of amens out there for the, from the parents. Yes, checking kids in. That's a great thing. Um, hey, as people are making their way in, uh, we do want to take some time this morning to give the church an update on the building team and the progress that the building team has been making. And uh, Keith Ridgway is one of our elders. For those of you who have been with us over the course of the summer, um, Keith might look like a brand new face for you, but he's actually been out and doing some travel with his wife and they're back now. Uh, but Keith, leading up to the summer, was uh, serving on our elder board and also uh, leading the building team and doing some other things here at the church. And so he has hit the ground running as he's been back, and he has a number of updates that he just wants to give to the church family as folks will come in. And if they miss it, we'll tell them, go watch it online because it's recorded. So, Keith. Thank you. Thanks, John. Well, I have the, the privilege of getting to speak from you today, but there's a tremendous amount of work being done by a lot of people and I'll mention them in just a second, but I, I want to uh, talk about the, the vision that we have uh, with the building team, the facility team. Uh, the Lord has more than doubled our, our size since we moved into this building in 2008, so that's about two years, and uh, we, we have a need for additional classroom space and uh, for Sunday morning and for Wednesday morning, and uh, so as we, we're working on the uh, the new classrooms we're trying to solve that short term you know we need classroom space now so that's what we're working towards uh, the long-term vision is that we're looking to to be a hub for community-wide bible study and we want to have the facilities to be able to do that we feel like the, that is what the lord's calling us to do and that's what we're working towards oh so next slide and next slide so uh, the first, uh, we were doing that in four phases, and uh, that was our, uh, the, the picture on the left was our, uh, kind of our original uh, sketching design that we're working on. And uh, as we got started, we had some zoning issues, so we had to move the buildings slightly. Instead of being uh, on that uh, paved area, we had to put them to the side. So the, what you see on the right is where they actually are right now. And next slide. So I don't know if you've uh, stepped out of the outside the kitchen area or looked out there, but uh, the buildings are, are there now. There's been a tremendous amount of work uh, accomplished on them. And uh, uh, so here here's the update on, on where we are. So uh, we've the uh, expected. Uh, cost to complete has been reduced from 125,000 to 95,000. You know, praise the Lord for that. We've uh, we we thought it was going to cost 100,000. We put 25,000 in for contingency because we thought there was probably 25 percent that we didn't know. It's amazing that we're even able to come in below that. So we're expecting 95,000 to complete. Uh, we've spent 41,000 to date. Uh, we we expect if you look at this the uh, the diagram on the right hand side uh, the green dots are the giving so we're at eighty two thousand given so far the blue line is our expected spend and uh, the orange dotted line is the actual expense to date so we spent forty one thousand to date uh, we expect to spend seventy five thousand by the end of September uh, we have eighty two thousand in giving that gives us a uh, a buffer of about seven thousand dollars by the end of September, and we expect we've got a uh, unfunded uh, uh, portion that we're of thirteen thousand that we're ha expecting to hit in October. So we've got thirteen thousand. But the Lord's been providing as we go along, and we're we're fully expecting Him to provide uh, uh, that thirteen thousand as we we finish up in October. So we've also, looking on the left side, the highlights, we've also accelerated the schedule by one month. So we've moved it from November to October. Uh, we've, we've set the buildings in place. We've got the electrical uh, uh, load center set. We've got the power poles there. Uh, we've installed skirting, paneling, lighting, HVAC. We had to buy a couple of new HVACs for one of the buildings. And uh, that's included in our cost. 
Uh, we've cleaned and prepped for the inside painting. And uh, so things that are coming up still left to do in September that we're going to finish the electrical. We're going to paint inside and outside. We're going to start building the ramps. And uh, we're going to put a new roof on one of the buildings. Then that leaves in October basically doing carpet and some of the furnishings on the inside. And uh, so uh, I want to say a special thanks to Paul McAmel, uh, Jim Wepler, uh, Ronnie Novak, Caleb Hare, uh, Michael Argio, Andrew Davies. I know there's others that have, have contributed, but these people have been up contributing in a major way. So I want to say thank. If you see them, say thank. Give them a thanks. But most of all, we want to thank the Lord. The Lord's given the, the finances. The Lord's given the skills for the people that are working, uh, the time to be able to do that. We want to point everything to him. I know each one of these persons that I mentioned would want to do that as well. So let's just praise him and let's get, uh, get started in our worship time this morning. Father, we, uh, we praise you as the, the one who's the provider. You're the provider of... Uh, the finances needed. You're the provider of the skills, and uh, you have blessed us so richly in both of those. And uh, we just want to lift up this time this morning to you. Would you just tune our our hearts to sing your praise? And uh, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fight that's in my soul. power burns like fire in my heart when waters rise i lift my eyes up to your throne we are more than conquerors through christ you have overcome this world this life
not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God. So 
blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when i'm found in the desert place though i walk through the wilderness blessed praise and worship team for that. Hey, if you're joining us this morning, we're glad you're here. We're going to take a moment and continue our worship by giving back to the Lord. Um, We are not passing the plate as of yet, but there are two offering uh, little boxes that are back in the foyer. So if you'd like to leave your offering there after the service, we'd encourage you to do that. If you're new or you're visiting with us or you're checking out our church, maybe you've been here for a few weeks, but you're still not sure where the Lord is leading you, we don't want you to feel any pressure to give. And so something that we do here as a church as an act of worship to God is to ultimately ultimately show our dependence and our hope and our trust in him. And it's not in the things of this world. It's not in the things that are temporary, but it's on the one who provides what we need for life. And he's the one who pours out every good blessing on us. So if you're new, uh, we'd like for you to be able to just receive. And uh, one of the ways you can do that is by connecting with us as a church. We do have physical newcomer cards that are out in the floor, but we also have a digital newcomer card you can access by texting new to BBC to 97,000. And so if you text that number new, and you send new to BBC as the message, uh, you'll get access to a digital newcomer card if we don't have your information yet. And we'd love to follow up and pray for you this week. So that's just something we'd love to do for you. But as we continue our worship this morning, let me pray for our offering and also that God will be magnified through the service. Lord, we uh, come to you and we just thank you that God, you are a God who does give good gifts. And so Father, we do thank you that you are the one who is moving uh, behind the scenes. And uh, Lord, in light of 
the season that we're in and seeing even how it, it, it seems like the coronavirus is receding again, uh, it's it's kind of waning now and it's not uh, on the rise. We just pray for your continued protection and provision. Lord, we know that no measure that we try to take against the op- opponents or the opposition in this world is sufficient unless you are with us. And so, Father, regardless of the challenge of the day, regardless of uh, the battle that we have to face, we call out on your name and we say that we trust in you. And so, Lord, our act of giving is an act of worship. It's just showing you, Lord, that we want you to be with us. We need you. We desperately depend on you. And we thank you that you are faithful, you are strong, and you are able to save, and you're able to come through over and over and over. It's just fascinating to see how your goodness is new to us every single morning, and your mercies are fresh for us. So, Lord, we come to you today. We just ask that uh, as we do give back, We would be giving with joyful hearts. We would be giving with great anticipation to see how you will move and go before us. And as Keith was giving the presentation just a few moments ago and showing how already how you are moving and you're providing for exactly what we need as we continue to move forward, Lord, we just thank you for that provision. And so, God, we give you our time this morning. We give you our hearts. We give you our minds. And now we give you our voices as we sing out this song in Jesus' name. Amen. This time kids are dismissed to children's church and while they are running around and oh is that the second service never mind ignore that sign <laughs> kids if you're in here stay put uh, in the meantime go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say hi
All right. How are my levels? Good. I'm getting some feedback up here. All right. The PA system is uh, wanting me to start. I think that's that's the that's the that's the the note for us to get going. All right. Well, find your seats. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is good for all of us to be here. I think it's uh, it's a fun thing to get back together and realize, hey, we can say good morning. And uh, hey, as a as a pastor here at the church, just my request for everyone who is here. If you do see someone who's wearing a face mask, they're just trying to be safe and careful, and so just be courteous as they're here as well. And many of us are not wearing face masks right now, but if you do see someone who is, just be courteous and, and tell them good morning and greet them. They want to be here just as much as anybody else, um, but just make sure that we're inc including them as we greet and say hey, good morning. But uh, if the PA system starts to get wonky on me as I, as I get going here, I'll give it a moment and we'll see if we don't, uh, or can avoid some feedback, but I hear a little bit of rumbling in the background. I'm not sure if you guys hear that or not, but uh, okay, it's just my ears then. Well, let, let me pray for us this morning as we get started, and it is good to be with you this morning. Lord, we come to you, and God, as we uh, study your word today, and as we look uh, at the next stage of really this series that we're in, uh, who is BBC, I just pray that you would really impress upon us the need for us to recognize um, really the, the mission and the role that the church has in your plan. And so, Father, as we uh, come together, we want to take this with great seriousness. We recognize that you have redeemed us, you have called us out, you have set us aside, and we have a purpose for why we are here. The church is not something that is here just to kind of coast through life, but, Father, there is a great mission ahead of us. And if we are not intentional with looking at how we engage and come together and fulfill that mission, then Father, we will simply tread water. And so our goal is to not be content to just sit in place, but that Father, you have a great plan for us as your body, as your uh, ultimate the body of Christ here gathering together to move and build your kingdom uh, until Christ returns. And so Lord, we thank you that we have time right now to stop and to look at this. And over the next couple of weeks, as we continue to really examine our church and our our DNA and what people should expect as they're here, I pray that this will be a very edifying experience that people will recognize that, God, we desire for them to grow in their relationship with Christ. And ultimately, the goal for all of us is maturity. And so, Lord, as we come together, um, we just pray that you're in our midst right now and uh, bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, last week we began this series, Who is BBC? And we looked at a few things. We looked at the why. So why do we get together? What's our motivation for getting together? And we talked about it's because of God's goodness and grace. Because of God's goodness and grace, that is the motivation for everything that happens. We recognize that God in his goodness called us out of the dominion of darkness and transferred us into his kingdom, the kingdom of light. And we are to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us, right? And so because of his goodness and grace is the why behind what we do. And so what is it that we do? What is it that we're about? And we talked about that last week. We exist, because of God's goodness and grace, we exist to know Christ and to make him known. And so that's our mission. That's our what. So last week we talked about the why and the what. Now, many of you, if you're a good student of uh, questioning in the line of questioning, you'll kind of say, well, why, what, what about how? How do you do that? Well, that's what today is about. Today is about the How? How many of you guys have ever been out to eat with your uh, beautiful, beautiful spouse uh, that looks a lot better than you? And yeah, right, hands are already going up. And, 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 and as you're out there eating with your spouse, you get this dish and there's something on the dish and the ingredients are all perfect. There's balance in the way it's presented. And as you taste it, it is like, Wow. Like my life just changed because I had this enter my mouth. Like there's something different about this. I don't know what it is. How many of you guys have had that experience? Like you just went out to eat. There's, well, there's one place my wife and I occasionally go. We don't go there too often. But there's a dish that I get and there's a special sauce that comes with it. I have no idea what's in that sauce. But every time I have it, I'm always like trying to lean in and ask questions. Like, so what is it about this that makes it so good? I think sometimes we look at churches and we might look at a church and we lean in and we're trying to figure out, like, what is it that makes this church so good? 
What about uh, uh, sports? Any of you guys are sports fans? Of course, today, unfortunately, sports is really in a messy situation, isn't it? It's just horrendous. I love sports. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a young guy here in Brenham, Texas. And in fact, when I shared my story last week of, of running and doing track and field, uh, Cliff Wilson, who was one of the elders here several years back, he came up to me and he told me the story of when he was walking around the track over at Blinn College. And as he was walking around the, the track, Cam Newton was out there exercising and doing warm-ups. Cam Newton, who's a uh, former quarterback for the uh, Carolina Panthers, he's now at the New England Patriots. Uh, Cam Newton is an interesting character to think about because Cam Newton uh, really throughout his professional career has really struggled with the, the mental depth of the game. And so his coaches have always done an exceptional job at simplifying the playbook so that Cam could be successful. How many of you guys kind of feel like Cam on some days? And you're like, don't give me a playbook that has 30 pages. I don't need all those plays. Give me a playbook where it's pretty simple. Well, today what I'm talking about in the how is really for some of you who love the cooking, it's, it's how the ingredients come together to make it pop. It's, it's, it's going and figuring out, well, what is it that just makes this so savory and wonderful and a great experience? For those of you who are sports, you might think of it and you might say, well, this is the playbook by which we can move the ball forward. This is the playbook by which we might see success on the field, which is really the, 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 the global field of reaching people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so last week we talked about this circle. This is the culture circle of our church, if we pull up the next slide here. And uh, the culture circle uh, really is designed to show us the why, the what, and the how. Now, this is not exhaustive of our church as a ministry. There's a lot of other things that are happening behind the scenes. There's a lot of other things that probably as you even begin to press down into these different areas, you will begin to realize Whoa, there's an entire plethora of things we could... That's a great word, isn't it? Plethora. There's an entire plethora of things we could study and examine and look at. What does this mean? What does that mean? But here we have the why. Because of God's goodness and grace, there's the what. We exist to know Christ and to make him known. And then here is how we're going to do it. And so today we're going to take five steps. Five steps, and in each of these, we're going to kind of move through fairly quickly. We're not going to take tons and tons of time. In fact, we could probably turn each one of those steps into an entire sermon series by itself. But each of those steps is going to be to worship together, to connect together, to serve together, to reach out together, and to pray together. And so as we work through this, I pray that as God is working on your heart, you would begin to realize, wow, this is actually a game plan for my spiritual maturity. Because the goal last week was maturity, and we recognize that maturity doesn't always equal safety in the light of the world and what the world thinks. But what Paul says is that's the safest, safest place you can be is the pursuit of knowing Christ. And it might lead you into what the world might say is unsafe conditions, but it's really the safest place to be. And so this is the game plan for your sanctification. This is the game plan for my sanctification. This is the game plan for the elders' sanctification as we are here. We are recognizing that we want a game plan as a church that's going to move the ball down the field and end up getting victory for Christ. We want to be successful as a church. We don't want to be complacent to sit and to be content to just say, well, we're going to figure out how to do ministry and just kind of roll the dice and see what happens. No, we're going to be intentional about doing things. And so as you're here, here's what I want to share with you as you think about these things, is that each of these stages, the worship, the connect, the serve, the reach out, and the pray, all of these certainly have a personal component to them. All of these have something that you can be actively engaging in throughout the week, but there's also a corporate side of that as well. And the corporate side is shown in the idea that as a ministry, we want to be intentional to be together. So before we jump into these five areas, you'll notice that each one of those says together, every single one of them. And here's what I want you to know as your pastor is that God made you for personal relationships. God made you for a personal relationship with him. God made you with a, for a personal relationship with other believers. And if you have made a commitment of faith in Jesus Christ, your identity is now established and it's built up in Christ as you now belong to him. And he has given you now a purpose to advance and build up his church. So the, the idea of togetherness is intrinsically important to this game plan. If we think that as a ministry, we can somehow silo people off and do things in isolation, we are bound to fail. 
We have to be able to work together and really be strategic in this. So he has given you a purpose to advance and build up his church. And here's the blessing of this is that as we do this, the loads are lighter, ministry and life is more rewarding, and we get to share the ups and downs of all this ride together. And so let's begin. Worship together. For each of these points, you're going to have a question that really our church will be raising. So the first point is worship together. Worship together. We're going to start at the very top of that circle there. Worship together. And the question is, is what am I treasuring with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And one thing that you might think of as you think of the word worship is probably what you just saw Adam and the worship team do, right? And certainly there's worship music. But you have to realize that worship is not just music. Worship is a genre of music. And so as we get together, we recognize that worship exists in all different forms and facets of our lives. When we get together and we pursue obedience to Christ, that is actually demonstrated during, uh, demonstrating worship to him. And so John, uh, sorry, I was kind of speaking before that verse came up. John 14, 21. John 14, 21. Here is Jesus, and he's speaking to his disciples in one of the last moments he has with them. And in John 14, 21, he says this. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. I mean, if there's a verse that you want to know what really this idea of worship's all about, certainly that's tied in with that verse. If you really understand what Jesus is saying, if you have my commandments and you keep them, then that's actually loving me. You see, when we worship, it's actually giving Christ worth in our lives. It's saying, you are worthy of me being obedient and how I speak to my friends. You are, me being, uh, you are worthy of me being obedient to you and what you've revealed to me and how I raise my children and how I treat my wife and how I pursue my job or my career and how I handle my taxes and how I go about making decisions for the next stage of my life. You are worthy and so I will obey, I will respond. And what's fascinating to me is that Scripture has a very deep connection between the love for God and really ultimately the sense of worship. This is the, you can't separate these two things out because if you inverse what Jesus is actually saying there, he is actually saying, if you have my commandments and you don't keep them, then you really you don't love me. I had a hard conversation with uh, someone this week, and we were talking about living in sin and pursuing sin. And what does it mean if you want to please the Lord in your life? And this is one of the first verses I pointed back to. I said, you might want to do this for this reason or that reason or this reason or that reason. And you can kind of justify in your head. I mean, all of us are experts at rationalizing, aren't we? We can rationalize to the end of the week why we should do something a certain way. But at the bottom of the day or the end of the line, you have to say, okay, if God has revealed something here for me in how I live my life, if I at that point say, you know what? I saw it's pretty clear here, but man, I feel so much easier, more convenient or financially. It makes more sense for me to do it this way. And my response to you as your pastor and certainly the elders' response to you as leaders of the church here and certainly ministry leaders as they're leading classes and ministries in different parts of our ministry, we want you to know that if you love Jesus, keep his commandments. If you do not keep Jesus' commandments, you don't love him. And that's a really heavy message because all of a sudden it makes you realize, oh, I got some gut check moments I got to think through in my life and what I'm doing and how I'm living. You see, our first piece of our strategy, our first really action plan that we're putting forward is we want you to be a worshiper of Christ. We want you to recognize what it means to be obedient, not just in coming and singing. That's part of praising is certainly part of worship. But worship is all of life encompassing. There's no part of your life that worship does not touch. As you sit here, as you leave from here, as you go out to eat, as you go about your work, as you raise your family, as you engage your friends, as you go shopping for various things, worship is all part of it. All of it's worship. 
your plans for the next stage of life. It's all worship. And really, it's connected to this principle of love. And love is the greatest Christian ethic. It's the greatest ethic of the Christian walk and the Christian life. Those who love Jesus live by his word. And love seeks the best for another. It's fascinating that as the New Testament writers were commentating on the Old Testament, they said all of the law, all of the prophets is summed up in this, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law was summed up in that. It's the love of God and the love of your neighbor. And certainly as a church, we want to be loving one another. And so the expression of even how we do these one another's is really an act of worship to God. And when we talk about that circle and worship, it's easy to kind of say, okay, well, this is this, this first one on the very top of that circle, worship. Well, that's just one thing. And then there's another thing. But I want you to hear this, that worship's connected to all of it. Worship's not just isolated there alone at the top. Worship is connected to all of it. And so as we begin, we have to start with worship. That's the, that's the beginning of where we go. And so as we move forward, we want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love those who are around you as you love yourselves. So we're going to worship together. Second point is this. We're going to connect together. And the question that we have as we measure whether or not we're moving the ball forward as we look both personally and corporately at that question is this. Who, with whom am I connecting as I grow in spiritual maturity? With whom am I connecting as I grow in spiritual maturity? A verse that pops out to me when I look at uh, the, the pursuit of connecting together is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, where it says this, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. And we just talked about that. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is really the return of Jesus, because Jesus is coming back. And so each week that we gather here, I want you to, in your head, make this connection. Each week that we come and we read the scripture and we preach and we sing and we do all the things here as a ministry, each week that we do that is one week less that we have between now and the time of Christ's return. Jesus is coming back sooner and sooner and sooner every time I see you. And so every time that we get together, we want to have intentionality in how we are pursuing ministry and how we are connecting together because times will get more difficult the closer to the end that we get. And it's going to be easy for some to fall away. It's going to be easy for some to say, you know what? I'm too busy. I've got golf. I've got this. I've got that. I've got, you know, f- appointment with my friends for breakfast. And I, my message to you is, is Jesus worth it or not? Is Jesus worth more than your golf game? Is Jesus worth more than your brunch? Is Jesus worth more than an extra hour of sleep? Because at the heart of this is really where your priority lies. And as your pastor, I'm going to tell you, you can be content to go and do all those things. But in love, I'm going to pursue you and say, is Jesus worth it? Because connecting together is a massive part of what God's plan is for the success of his church. If you think that you can go and sleep in and somehow succeed in the Christian life, you're only kidding yourself. Nobody else is buying into that except for you. Don't be complacent. Don't sleep in. Give Christ the first of what you have. And so we want to come together and give him our time. And it's not just about coming together on Sunday morning, but it's coming together through the week. It's coming together to worship him in small groups. It's coming together to uh, uh, share a meal with other families, to get together in other ministries and say, how can I help encourage you to, to build you up? Because the connecting of us together is crucial for our own spiritual growth and discipleship. In fact, I will say this, discipleship happens best in the context of small community. It's amazing to come together on a Sunday morning and to worship. That's a huge part. And, and worship is, again, again it's, it's kind of a loaded term there because there's so much more to worship than just what we're doing in the service. 
But when you get to know people and you're connecting and you're sharing your life and you're sharing your story and you're connecting on a really authentic, transparent level, that connecting together is what the Holy Spirit and God has planned for you is to use that so that you begin to have other believers share and pour into your life and then you can begin to share and pour into theirs. If you try to live life in isolation away from the Christian community, you're going to fail. You're going to fall out. You're going to burn out and you will not know Christ, and make him known. And so we want you to be pursuing authentic relationships in your life that reciprocate love and encouragement and accountability as you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Third thing is we want you to be serving together. We want you to be serving together. When we look at the game plan and how we're going to be successful, we look at the recipe and we're going to say, how do we make this the uh, most amazing, life-changing recipe? The great news is, and here's full, full, full confession and full transparency, the great news about this is that the, uh, the, the team that met and we worked on really identifying and clarifying how we're putting these things, we didn't create this stuff. It's already in the scripture. All we had to do is say, let's make sure we're clear on what words we're using as we're trying to explain to people what the game plan is or what the recipe is here. And so here we want you to be serving together. There's an intentional aspect to serving, and we want you to be asking the question really simply of where am I serving? And what that means is, where am I using my God-given gifts to build up the church? Because serving can look a number of different ways to a number of different people, but we want to clarify that a little bit. We want to say, where are you using your God-given gifts to build up the church? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Peter writes this to the church. He says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. I love that verse. 1 Peter 4.10, what Peter is saying there is as God has redeemed you and restored you and he's re, uh, reconciled you back to himself, he, is saying, he has said you are now justified. He's in the process of making you this new creation and he is pouring out his grace over you. As he is doing that, you are called to steward it. There's a stewardship dynamic in what the grace is that's been poured out on you. And with what the blessing and the grace that's being poured out on you, he's given you new giftings. He said, some of you are going to be amazing at speaking and proclaiming the word. Others of you are going to have a sense of deep joy as you give, and you're going to be able to inspire others to give in ways that they have never done before. He says, others of you are going to be leading. Others of you are going to be doing this or this or this. And I'm going to let you know that the ministry here at our church, one of the reasons why people say, wow, what's it, wow why is this ministry so vibrant? It's because it's not a one-man show. This ministry is all about helping people learn to serve God by using their gifts to build up his church. This is not our church per se. Certainly we attend here, but this is his church. He owns this. This is here because of him. And he wants you to be part of what's going on here. He wants you to be using your gifting so that he receives glory. We have all kinds of areas in our church where people are currently serving. And I will tell you that I am in many ways deficient to really meet the needs of some of these different areas because my giftings just aren't there. But I look at the, the list and there, there's, this is just a very short sampling of really all the areas that are there. We have building and facility teams. We have a hospitality team that does all kinds of greeting and hopefully... Lord willing, coffee again very soon. Um, we have congregational care. We have finance teams. We have kids, men, student ministries, youth, next generation, college, young adults. We have small group leaders. We have the worship team. And again, worship, careful with that word. But the the, you guys would get what I'm saying. The praise team. We have an outreach team that is actually getting together. We're looking at putting some more strategy and, and really tactical steps around how are we doing missions, both locally and globally and regionally. Uh, so, or locally, regionally, globally. Sorry. Uh, we have communications team. How many of you guys have a camera and love to take great pictures? Guess what the church website constantly needs for communicating? Great pictures. Um, we have all kinds of areas. Anybody know how to do a website? It is by God's grace we have what I have. We, we have what I, we have because I'm the one who put it together and trust me, I don't know a thing about web development. So if somebody knows how to do web development, there's space for you to serve. 
That's what I'm getting at. There's space, there's ample room for people to serve here at our church in so many different areas. Now, there are certainly pitfalls in serving, and I think this is where I think a lot of us come to the, the table of saying, well, I want to serve, but man, I don't know. And here's a couple pitfalls. Not serving because you don't know what your spiritual gift is. If you don't know what your spiritual gift is, we're glad to help you find that. But I would also encourage you by saying this. It's good to try a variety of things. It's good to say, you know what? I've never really worked with kids. I'll try it for a semester. I'll see how it goes. I've never led a small group. Let me see how that goes. I'll try doing it for a semester. These are good things. These are, don't be afraid of failing because you don't know what your gifts are. Just say, hey, I'm willing to be used. Let's see how God shows up. Because here's, what I'm, here's an important part of serving the Lord is if you think you can accomplish your, the ministry that he's entrusted to you in this church or any other church or mission organization, and you think you can do it in your own strength and you're setting yourself up to have a very weak ministry, but if you enter into your mindset of serving the Lord and you say, God, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to see what you do here and I'm going to follow in obedience, which really is connecting my love to Jesus. I'm obeying and so therefore I'm, a, I'm loving and I want you to show up. I want you to just disclose yourself to me like John 14 said earlier. Then wow, you better watch out because God's going to radically do some crazy stuff in that ministry. He's going to bring growth and health and excitement and new believers. You're going to see people all having life change falling out all over the place. I mean, it's going to be amazing. And that's how our God works. He says, I'm going to equip those that I'm calling to do a certain work for me. It's not that I'm going to call the equipped to do the work. Do you see the difference? So God wants to work in you. You don't have to be uh, afraid of being stuck forever in a ministry at our church. Uh, a lot of you have heard of churches where it's like, yeah, I signed up for the kids ministry. I'd never escaped. <laughs> they tied me to the table and I couldn't get away. Uh, little Johnny. Yeah, no, here we want you to be uh, able to say, hey, I want to serve for a season in this. I want to see what the Lord does here. I want to see how he grows me in this. And I'll tell you this, sometimes serving in an area with, that's deficient for you is where God will do some of his greatest amazing work because you realize, wow, this isn't me doing this. It's clearly him. Another thing that people are afraid of is, uh, or, or, or fearful of is not serving in a particular role because it's not your fit. And again, I would just say, just go for things. See what happens. Uh, fear of being alone. That's a reality. How many of you have thought, man, I would love to do this, but I don't want to be alone. We want to help you not be alone. We want to help you have multiple people coming with you. And so you can invite your friend. You can invite someone that you know and you love. And you say, hey, God's laying on this in my heart. Do you think you'd be willing to help co-lead or serve with me in doing that? And, and, and certainly, by all means, if, you, if, there's, if they say no, then come to the elders or come to the ministry lead team or whoever else you need to talk to and say, hey, I feel like God's leading this on me, but I don't want to do it all by myself. What would you say? What would you recommend? What, how can you help me with this? We'd love to help you with that. Chances are we've probably had a conversation with somebody else who said the exact same thing. And all we have to do is say, oh, well, let me get you to talk to this person over here because, you know, God's moving in, in your heart and in their heart. And it, it appears that he's moving us as a ministry to pursue this that we normally would not have. But now he's laying it on your heart and we're saying, great, let's go do that. And so if you don't know where to plug in, just know Sharon Ridgeway, who's up here. She didn't know I was going to call her out by name, but Sharon, who's up here, she has stepped forward over the last year and really helping formulate all the different areas in our church where you can begin to serve. And this is an ongoing development. We're still working on developing and defining a number of different areas that we already have opportunities for volunteers. And so if you want to volunteer and you're just like, I don't know where, but I'm willing, Sharon is a perfect place to get started. And she would love to sit with you and say, hey, let me see where God's leading you and how this is going. And from there, we'll be glad to get you plugged in. But here's the application I would say is that you should join an area in our church to serve. Sound booth or somewhere else. I mean, there's any number of places that you can go and God can use you to bless others and build up his church. And so use your spiritual gift as an act of worship to him. Fourth thing is that we want you to reach out together. Reach out together. And when you reach out, really the question, the measurable that we're looking for is the, the answer to the question, who am I reaching with the gospel? 
Um, when we uh, look at really what God has led us to do, we recognize that Jesus gave us a great commission. And in fact, uh, uh, from a very personal side of it, there's definitely an, a dynamic where we do approach people individually and we say, hey, we want you to know Jesus. I mean, that's why we're here. We want to know Jesus and to make him known. A uh, personal story that we see in scripture of that happens in John chapter 1. And Andrew, one of the disciples, this is before he's a disciple, he's hearing John talking about Jesus. And so he's hearing what's going on. He's hearing about Jesus. He's hearing about the Messiah. He runs to find Peter and he says to him, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. And he brings him to Jesus. It's a great personal example right there in the first, in the first chapter of the gospel of John where Andrew hears the good news of Jesus. He grabs Peter and he brings him to go see. And we know the rest of the story from there. Certainly Peter becomes one of the greatest figures in the disciples and he's doing all crazy, all kinds of crazy things throughout Jesus' ministry. Uh, but in Acts 1.8, Acts 1.8, there is a corporate side of this as well in which we are, need to gather together to reach out together. And in Acts 1.8, it says, and this is Jesus as he's speaking to his disciples before he ascends back into the heavens. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem in all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And so what's our strategy here for reaching out as a local church? We have local connections all through Brenham and Washington County with other ministries that we're supportive of. We have individuals who go and serve there, but we also, for some of the ministries, have different teams of people that serve in different locations. And so we encourage a both and approach. My mindset, and certainly the elders' mindset, is we don't want to have to uh, red tape off every opportunity that you would like to go serve as an individual. We want you to be able to say, if the Lord's leading you as a member of our church to go serve and bless another ministry, by all means, be a blessing and a witness for Jesus as you go there. You don't need our permission to go do that. But if there's a greater need that a ministry has that we would like to partner with here locally, we will be glad to work together to build up a team to specifically be a blessing and serve or support them in such a way that they can help, help further their mission to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we have a number of different uh, partnerships here. We have For the City, we have New Beginnings, we have Embrace Grace, which we launched last year, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see that blossom this year. We have Sandy Creek Ministries that we're actively supporting in. Uh, we have Trail Life, which is a ministry that got launched here at our church a few years back, and I went on a 5.3 mile hike yesterday, and so my leg is not woken up yet from that. Um, but we have all these kind of fun things that we do here at the church, and this is by no means exhaustive. Neither should it be something that you say, well, they don't really have this opportunity, so I'm not going to pursue that. If you want to pursue something, come let me know and kind of, you know, come talk to Sharon. We'd love to do this, but this is where we're outreaching. Regionally, we have uh, EFCA district churches that we're in connection with. In fact, we have a unique opportunity that uh, the elders and I are going to be praying about and examining uh, with uh, another church plant, Hispanic church plant out in Odessa, Texas, that is looking to help them get started. And so there's, uh, you know, other ministries like that regionally that we're looking at and we're praying about, God, what would you have us do as a church to, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reach out through other ministries? Uh, globally, we have uh, the Josephs down in Haiti. They're going to be here in a few weeks. In fact, there's a great story with that. If you saw the newsletter, you'll have caught on to some of that. Uh, but they'll be here in a few weeks, uh, and they're looking forward to getting back to Haiti, continuing their mission there. Um, we've had the, the Richards or Richards down in Liberia that we've been supportive of as a church. And so we want to be a church that doesn't just have an impact here. We want to have an impact globally. We want to be more intentional. And so, in fact, even the missions team is getting together in the next week, and we're going to be looking at developing some uh, next steps for what that team's goals and really uh, guidelines should be as we're at identifying partnership opportunities. But the individual efforts, and here, let me close uh, this portion out on the individual efforts. There are people throughout our church who are doing things individually that many of you might have just a small window or snippet into, but I want to just highlight just a few of these because it, it warms my heart as a pastor to know that I have people in my church who are so on fire for Christ. 
that they're not content to simply just say, well, if BBC doesn't offer that, I'm not going to do it. They said, no, I want to be involved in this because I feel like God is leading me to do this. And so I'm going to demonstrate obedience. And certainly they serve here too in other capacities. But listen to this. We have people serving at family life, marriage ministries, and parenting conferences. We have orphanage ministries in Mozambique where people are actively serving. We have Christian schools that are getting launched and are being supported, not just here, but around the world through people here in our church. We have prison ministry activity by a number of people here in our church. We have private missionary support from individuals here in our church. We have uh, individuals who have provided shelter and jobs for people who are at need right here in our church. None of that has been a top-down coordination from our ministry to say, we're going to figure out how to do this. It's been God leading people right here in our church body to say, I'm going to meet that need because I see it. And so as your pastor, I want to let you know, if you see a need and God's bringing something into your life and you're like, wow, this is a great opportunity for me to be Jesus, to be the hands and feet of Christ, then do it. Go do it. And if you need help, we're here. But, but go do it. Respond to the call. The final uh, peg on the wheel, so to speak, on the, the five points is pray together. Pray together. And the question that we have with this is for whom and for what am I praying? I think it's interesting that when we look at our prayer life and we examine the content of our prayers, it really reveals that what's going on inside of our hearts. Uh, when you really look at your prayer and you say, wow, am I praying kind of selfishly right now? And some of us often do that. I mean, I've, I've been very guilty of praying selfishly at different points of my life for things that I really wanted. And uh, I look at my prayer life and I say, okay, what is the content of my prayer? What am I speaking, spending time really uh, engaging in? In Ephesians 6 Paul encourages believers in Ephesus as part of this conclusion of the armor of God. He says that we have to engage in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, he says this, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And so we want all of the ministries here at our church to be prayerful ministries. We want small group leaders, we want Sunday school teachers, we want ministry leaders to be praying for those ministries. In fact, there's been studies that have been done that really are pretty, uh, it, it sounds like this in a bad way when I say this, but they're kind of mind boggling, but it's, but it's showing exactly what the Bible is teaching us. Studies have been done in small groups and uh, there were several thousand small groups a few years ago that were surveyed and they were asking, what are the healthy dynamics? Why are you healthy? What are the different things that you're doing? The number one common denominator for health in a small group of thousands of small groups all across the U.S. from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches, the number one common denominator in a healthy small group was that they had a leader who prayed for the people there. Not just in the group time, but throughout the week. And in a way, it's kind of mind-boggling because you're like, wow, I know that prayer matters, but like, wow, did it really sink into me how much it matters? <laughs> for, for ministries to be healthy, for us as a church to be vibrant and active and moving forward. And I want to let you know that we have people here and we want to invite you to be part of that process. This is part of the recipe. This is part of the game plan. We want to be a prayerful church. We want to be praying together. The, 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 the idea of corporate worship and small groups and prayer teams, all of these things are active here, but we want you to also be personally praying for God's work here at our church. Spurgeon was a great pastor in England many years ago, and he had a new man come into his church, and the new man was amazed at, at Spurgeon's church. He was like, wow, this is an amazing ministry. You know, you've got amazing uh, choir, and you've got amazing preaching, and you beautiful facility. And Spurgeon told him, he said, hey, I want to show you what the, the, the most amazing part of our ministry is. This is why everything is so successful here. And he led the man kind of down this corridor around the, the back of the church. And he went down a little flight of stairs. And he went into this room. And in their room, there was a couple dozen people that were just praying for the ministry. And that was what they had committed to do as a church. They said, we're going to do this every single week. We're going to have a team of people down here praying. I want to let you know that for the last two years since we've been in this church, we've been doing that. And God's been bringing growth. He's been bringing support. He's been bringing the expansion. He's been bringing the new buildings. And as your pastor, I want to let you know that the team of people who meets back in the conference room at 9 a.m. every single Sunday, 
They're just as much a part of the reason why we're successful and why we're vibrant as the giving or as the preaching or as the singing or anything else. But we are a church that wants to pray together. And you can be part of that team. There's no application to go back there. You just show up at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning before the services start. And there's a team of people back there praying every single week. So as we close out, this is our strategy for spiritual growth. This is our strategy to say we want you as an individual to have a game plan for your life and see how God moves in you. Because of God's goodness and grace, we exist to know Christ and to make him known. And we will accomplish this by worshiping together, connecting together, serving together, reaching out together, and praying together. And so let me pray as we close, and uh, I hope you're enjoying this series as we're moving into it. But I pray that as you're here and you're listening and you're seeing that our church really has a heart to make sure that you grow and there's a plan for you to grow. And as you're here, you have a purpose for why you're here. And so maybe this might be where you should make your church home. Lord, we uh, come to you this morning and we uh, just thank you for our time. I pray that as we do close out today and we look at what you're doing, you will stir us to uh, good work as we spend time with each other. Help us to be challenging each other and not being complacent. Uh, I thank you for all the different people who are here at our ministry who are working in great and powerful ways. And as you continue to grow and expand the things that are happening here, Lord, make people as they see Brennan Bible Church clearly say, I'm seeing Jesus at work. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, there we go. These wireless mics make lots of things more convenient if you remember to turn them on. Let's stand as we close today. What gift of grace is Jesus my Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley. He will. shall overcome yet not I but through Christ
long to follow Jesus For he has said that he will bring me home And day by day I know he will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus.